Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. This is Beyond the Lines, and I'm Rusty Komori. We are live on Mondays from the beautiful Think Tech Hawaii TV studio in the Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. This show is based on my book, which is also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, achieving greater success and sustaining that greater success, leadership, and finding greatness. Today's guest is Christine Kemp. She is the president and CEO of the Avalon Group, which is a real estate development and brokerage services firm she founded in 1999. Christine is an extraordinary leader who has achieved incredible success, and her story will inspire countless people to strive for excellence every day. Today, we are going beyond real estate. Christine, so nice having you on the show today. Thank you for having me. You were born in South Korea? I was. Can you tell me about your early years growing up there? Sure. Um, we were poor. Mm. Um, uh, but, you know, I didn't know what it was like being poor because we were always without. Sure. Um, but my parents decided that they would like to come to America to uh, allow us to have the best of education and opportunities. We believed in the American dream. Great. So we arrived here just before I turned 10, um, not speaking a, a word of English, really, but, you know, except to say I'm hungry. Okay. <laughs> because I was told that food grows on trees in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, you know, hi, my name is Hyunhee, which is my name, Hyunhee Kim. Okay. Um, it really, um, Growing up with not a lot, with political oppression, oppression. Even when I was that young, I knew what it was uh, to have a curfew. Wow. And you had to get off the streets and get into a home by midnight. I knew what it was like to speak ill about the government and go to jail. Because wow. I knew people, including my father, who did. Oh no. Um, who you know almost did. Excuse me. So it was um, those types of persecution that I was familiar with. So coming to America was a dream. And it was, you know, everything that I imagined it to be, being here now. Yeah. Um, I am just relish the fact that we're here in America and, and the opportunities it has given me. And the only reason why I appreciate it 10 times more than anyone else is because I'm a Korean American. Great. From Korea. Great. So how, how was your living conditions like in South Korea at that time? Well, it was pretty tough. Um, we, we were fairly well off and then something happened. I'm not sure when I was really young. So we uh, lived in an area where there was no running water wow. and no toilets. It was just an outhouse. Wow. And we had to actually go every morning in the winter, all the kids, to get the bucket of fresh water they could drink and pump it back. You know, basically you go to the common pump, get the bucket of water, and then you walk all the way up the hill so that you could have drinking water. And so I experienced that. I mean, you had a, literally a hole in the wall Whoa. for toilet. And so that was the literal outhouse. And so, you know, I've, I've experienced it. And, and then coming to America and seeing the toilet and not knowing what it was. Yeah. Do you stand on it? What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 what do you do? It doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it really was difficult. And uh, it was a period where my parents are, were here making a home for us. And so about two years, two and a half years, almost three years while we're waiting for our immigration paperwork, we lived with relatives wow. from one relative to the other and, um, and generally surviving on leftovers and goodwill of uh, people. So what, what schools did you attend when you came to Hawaii? When I first attended um, Aliolani Elementary for um, a few months, it was a very difficult period where my idea of America and uh, um, you know the, the kids who were fairly mean I'm sure they didn't mean it but the ostracizing of you know the immigrants in oh. that area was very difficult then we moved to um, uh, East Honolulu where we went to Wilson Elementary then Kaimiki High School and I graduated from Kalani High School 
But one thing that's a changing experience, and I still remember it to this day, is Mrs. Hasegawa, oh. my homeroom teacher. Okay. We were instructed to write poetry, and I wrote something about the Mailele. And um, she told class, class, I have something to announce. I have an extraordinary poem I need to read to you. And she read the poem as if I wrote it. Of course, it was the gist of what I wrote, I think. Yeah. But she wrote it so well. And it made all the class kids look at me like I was a smart kid. Wow. And it gave me confidence to become myself. It made me proud of who I was. Just because of that one little poem that I did and how she showcased it, it changed me, profoundly changed me to think that I could write, to think that I was going to get even better and write more poetry wow. and, uh, and be the best English student. And because of that one woman, Mrs. Hasegawa, I still remember her, Ethel Hasegawa. And I wonder whatever happened to her. Because little acts like that by a teacher to give confidence to a child who sorely needed it. Yeah, it's priceless. Yeah, it changed who I was yeah. and how others perceived me. Wow, see, teachers have such yeah. uh, huge impact on the lives of so many. And it's, it, that story is amazing right there. Now, how was your English at that time? Not very good. Okay. But the good thing about my parents uh, my mom especially was that we weren't allowed to speak Korean when we were at home okay. because they believed in 100% assimilation. You do not speak um, English. Even with her broken English, she would speak to us in broken English. My father passed away within 11 months of oh. being here. And so it was just her raising five children. Hmm. And she wanted us to make sure that we succeeded. And for her, the only way to succeed in America was assimilation. And so we spoke English. And within six months, we were fairly, um, you know, uh, conversational. Okay. Within a year, we were fluent. Oh, wow. That's quick. Right. Very quick. Did you do any sports in high school? Um, I was a cheerleader. Awesome. Um, for a while. But um, I remember the first sports that I did was um, summer fun okay. in the public park system where I played basketball in sixth grade. Great. And I just remember that I could not afford shoes. So kids who are disadvantaged don't have money for the balls, the equipment, the uniform. They allowed us to um, register for free, but there were no shoes. So I used shoes that were too small during the whole summer, and I lost every one of my toenails. But it was OK oh, no. because I got to learn basketball, yeah. an American sport. Well, you must have been excited to, I to was be doing excited that. <laughs> to lose my toenails, but to play with other kids, absolutely. Now, what what was your first job? You know, what what did you get start to get paid money for back then? So, I um, decided that I was going to help out my parents and okay. my mom, and so I put out little cards in laundromats and in supermarkets okay. in those days you could to babysitting service. Oh, great. And um, the minimum wage was under $4 then. And I was making maybe $10, $20 a night awesome. babysitting kids. Um, How old were you? I was 12 years old. Okay. It was sixth grade. <laughs> and then I even hired my sister and a friend of mine. So I even had subcontractors and employees <laughs> <laughs> because the business became booming. I had yeah. a great reputation. And um, I did that, and that was my very first job. Um, it was quite successful and pay for my finishing school and all the extracurricular things that my mom couldn't know. I, I didn't have the heart to ask my mom for. Then, um, but I did have failures. Really? I what? had a, my first business that was official, actually registered. It was Style Krista. And it was where I bought 3,000 Chinese silk teas when I was 18. And I had all of my friends who were artists paint on them. Then I would ship it to tourists who might want it. Um, I think I spent ten thousand oh, dollars, wow. all of my life savings, wow. and then some. Um, so why did it the, fail? Because I didn't know what I was doing. Okay. Um, <laughs> it, I was advertising in a magazine that was too expensive, and my target market really would have been swap meet, not in the magazines. But you know, lesson learned. Yeah. And it's something that I never forget. Market research is that important. So it was a very expensive um, mail order business that I had. But I, I learned something, and, and to me, that was worth it. Looking back, it was yeah. worth it. At that time, very painful. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you go to college here? I did. Where did um, you go? So I started with KCC, then HCC, oh. then UH, wow. then HPU. So my degree is from HPU. And the reason why I go through those processes is that I graduated during my junior year, before wow. I was 18 
to get a diploma, you had to be enrolled in college to receive a diploma. Otherwise, you had to go stay in high school. So KCC was my option at $32 per credit hour. Really? Um, but they never had the classes I needed because I was working. I had to pay for my mom's mortgage okay. while I was working and paying for my tuition. So it wasn't really good for working students. Yeah. And, um, and there was never a thought of going away for college because I knew that we couldn't afford it. Um, but, you know, even with scholarships, I don't think I we could have afforded it. Well, you learned from almost every college here. <laughs> every college. But HPU gave me a, a terrific education. UH gave me a terrific education. Every class meant something okay. because I was working toward a career. Yeah. So every class was something that I would learn and I would apply it back to my work, or from work, I would apply it back towards my study. Awesome. So it took me over t 10 years <laughs> to graduate, but I did graduate. Yeah. I have a degree in business management and finance. Great. Now, after graduating, what became your first official job? So I didn't graduate from college when I had my official job. Okay. I had my official job before I graduated oh, from college, wow. and my employers kind of pushed me along to get my degree. Okay. Um, but my first job out of high school, was a Girl Friday, which is like an administrative assistant in today's terms, mm -hmm. but for a developer. And he was a single developer, and he allowed me to do as much as I would like to learn. Great. And I worked every weekend to catch up for what I didn't know. So I learned that for five years, recruited by Castle & Cook awesome. to work for them for Mililani Mauka. Wow. And that was my big career um, step up. Then a and Great. So it was all in increments of five years because I have a tendency to think in five-year goals. Yeah. Wow. So after working at all of those great places, mm -hmm. um, you started your own company, Avalon, in 1999. And I, I'm curious, what, why did you choose the name Avalon for your company? Well, I always used to think that you should be at the top versus at the bottom. So it wouldn't start with a Z. So it would be something with an A. Okay. <laughs> um, but it was the Isle of Avalon. I was. Um, I love fairy tales and I love the King Arthur stories. Oh yeah, Excalibur. Excalibur, okay. right? Yeah. The Isle of Avalon is where his source of power came from. Okay. And when he died, it returned back to back to the source. And to I the thought, island. To the Isle of Avalon. Okay. So to me, my feeling was that we're on an island. My company is for Hawaii, and I'm from Hawaii. So I wanted it to be something relevant. Well. What a, what a great story. I had no idea about that. Now, I've been seeing a lot of Facebook posts about mm -hmm. Hale Kalai. Hale Kalai, Can yes. Can you tell me about that? So that's our 7,000 Hawaii Kai project. Okay. We built that project for Hanwha, a Korean company, um, in 2016. So in June, we uh, built it as a rental project. Great. But um, two years later, after operating as a rentals, uh, we were able to buy the building from Hanwha, and um, uh, right now we're looking at providing options for people to buy their own units. Awesome. So there are two buildings. One building will remain as a rental, and that's called Hale Manu. Okay. And the other one, 7000 Hawaii Kai, is now renamed to uh, Hale Kalai, okay. and it will be condominiums. It's great for people to have those options, right. you know, and in terms of living and buying or renting. Now, you recently broke ground in Kapolei. Yes. Can you tell me about that? So we own 178 acres of industrial land in um, Kapolei. That's awesome. And we've been in Kapolei since 2006. Wow. So um, you see us breaking ground about once or twice a year, yeah. and, and that's usually out in Kapolei because we're building warehouses. And so the most recent one uh, where the, you can see that Mayor was supporting us there, okay. um, sure. Council Member Pine and um, Ty Cullen, the representative. They're very supportive because we want to create jobs. So Kapolei was meant to be second city. Yeah. And what that means is not just bedrooms, but it must have jobs. And so my goal there has been always looking for places where we can create employment that is beyond just retail and service, but it would be something more related to professional and higher paying jobs. Great. And so we're very focused on the industrial park. We're done, so we're developed up through about 120 acres. We've got the last 50 left. Wow, that's awesome. I'm curious also, Christine, what, what's what been your most meaningful project that you've built so far? The most meaningful project, every one of them has oh, been meaningful. Yeah, I'm sure. So I can't choose which yeah. one it is. 
But the one that we're currently working on, Hale Kalai, yeah. is one that is very meaningful to me because um, we were able to convince a Korean owner through my Korean heritage wow. to t touch their hearts and be able to commit to building affordable housing right on site. Great. They, they were going in the direction of a million to three million dollar houses. Wow, that's a and lot. What I was able to do is to build for people who I grew up with, who couldn't live in East Honolulu yeah. because they couldn't afford it. So now we have rental options for them and housing options, and we built it with families in mind. Most of rental housing is studios and one bedrooms. Ours start at two bedrooms. Oh, awesome. All the way to four bedrooms. Great. Christine, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, I want to really go in-depth into really why you are successful. Okay. Thank you. You are watching Beyond the Lines with my guest Christine Camp on Think Tech Hawaii. We will be back in one minute. I'm Jay Fidel, Think Tech. Think Tech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha. Hey, Stan the Energy Man here on ThinkTech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff. But I really like energy stuff, so I'm going to keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stand Energy Man at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour. We're going to talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're going to definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. Welcome back to Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. Today, we are going beyond real estate with my guest, Christine Kemp, the president and CEO of the hugely successful company, the Avalon Group, she founded in 1999. Christine, I want to ask you um, some of these questions that really directly relate to my book. How would you define success? That's a Good question, <laughs> because I think before I was a mom, yeah. it would have been a different one. Okay. Now that I'm a mom, it's, a, it's completely changed me. So I define success universally by, not by the money that you make okay. or the things that you have, but the respect of your peers and your community and your family. Um, and having love, having enough resources to be able to appreciate that. Sure. And I have that now, and I feel very successful. Oh, that's awesome. Now, why are you successful? Why am I successful? So in my way of defining success, the reason why I'm successful is because I care. OK. So everything I do, I do with one, my utmost effort, and I do it to succeed. And, and the reason I do this is because anything that I do, someone else is relying on me. It would be my family, my community, my employees, my investors, and my lenders. So everything I do, I do it with a complete sense of gratitude that they're giving me the opportunity to do this. And um, I think with that and that attitude of gratitude, <laughs> there you yeah. go, it, makes, um, it makes a good recipe for success. I, I like these, uh, these insights. Now, what has been your greatest obstacle in achieving your success, and then how did you overcome that? The greatest obstacle to me, and I think for a lot of us, um, is fear. Hmm. You're afraid. What if you fail? And the more you get successful, the more you have to lose. And so the fear sets in, I don't want to lose what I've achieved. Yeah. And so every time, I always have to ask myself, what do you have to lose and if you don't try? And, you know, with that question, the answer is always, well, I can always go back to when I was homeless. <laughs> yeah. I didn't have anything, yeah. but I tried and I got to where I needed to go. So I have to try now. Yeah. No, that in sports or business, you know, the fear of losing 
um, is a mindset, but also playing to win is, is the mindset that everyone should have. Yeah. How do you weigh risk in terms of fear of losing versus striving to win? Where does risk come in? Uh, you have to, right, so everyone says, well, you're, you're such a risk taker. You're taking $100 million bets on these things. <laughs> you know, like right now, my most recent project, Sky Almana, is yeah. $450 million. Oh, wow. You're making a $450 million bet on one project. That sounds very risky, but it's not. You do it with thoughtful consideration. If you think through your market and all the other things. And so it's really about breaking it all down yeah. and seeing all of the issues and weighing them through the pros and cons. And so I always have pros and cons. And, yeah. and that's how you get through your fears, is yeah. you break it down into little areas and you can address it one at a time. And taking calculated risks. Right. And that's, then, that's exactly right, calculated yeah. risks. You said it better than me. <laughs> <laughs> and I also believe, and I talk about it in the book, that you know, risk promotes growth. You know, we all have taken risks as babies, right? Otherwise, we'd all still be crawling exactly. right now. So risk is a huge thing in terms of developing yourself, but also helping develop others. Um, what, what would you say is, your, is in your future? What are you hoping to aspire in huh. your future? Well, this year, we're going to be celebrating um, our 20th year of Avalon. Wow. So I think 20 years of having a business and growing it, you don't do it yourself. Okay. You do it with your employees. So for the next 10 years, my goal is to transition ownership to people who've helped me build it. Oh, that's awesome. And if awesome. I can do that, I will be very successful. Wow, that's, a, that's great insight. I mean, that's really caring about everyone that, that you work with right there. I do. I'm very appreciative of them because during the worst of times, you know, we lost. So we did very, very well into 2008. Yeah. And everything fell, and every penny that I've ever earned, we lost it that, in that one year, mm. and gapping all the issues and risks that we've taken. Who knew that the whole world was going to fall off? Yeah. And so uh, these people who had stayed with me took pay cuts and rolled up their sleeves and did things like janitorial and you know property management, handyman. They did whatever was needed. They were utility players. To, so that the company could survive. And you remember them. I will never forget it. Yeah. Never forget it. Awesome. You, you talked about Sky Alamoana mm -hmm. earlier. Um, is that your next big upcoming project? Yes, it is. And I'm very proud of it because um, we are building uh, close to 800 units. Wow. Where is it going to be exactly? It'll be right across where the transit station will be on Kapiolani Boulevard. Um, across Alamoana Shopping Center. Okay. It'll be um, east of Kiamoku on Kapiolani Boulevard. But the reason why I'm really proud of it is that we're going to build affordable housing Great. right on this site. So um, we, we will have um, approximately 90 affordable units to be sold. And, um, and that's been subsidized by hotel units awesome. and um, the condo units. And our condo units are by no means luxury. They start at 500000 and it ends at around $850,000 mm -hmm. right in town. And um, we also am proud of the fact that we'll be creating job centers. Oh, wow. Where right off the transit center, there'll be a hotel. Great. Now, I mean, you've been in real estate for over 20 years now. Oh, 30 years. 30 yes. years. <laughs> That's 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you started when you were in your teens. Yeah, uh, literally. <laughs> no, so um, it, it's very interesting. What kind of ideas do you have, do you have, in solving the homeless issue that we have here? You know, um, I think for me, homelessness has two factors. One is the houseless, those who are working but just can't make their ends meet. And the other is just you know, they need institutional help. Okay. They need a lot of support. So we have to be able to see them for what they are and be able to address them one segment at a time. Okay. I think the easiest or the more achievable results in the near future are those that are houseless. Yeah. They're working and they, they need to keep their dignity and be able to find something where they can raise their family. So in, to do that, you have to allow more homes to be built. The state has issued a, a, a report that says 65,000 homes have to be built in the 10 years. That's 6,500 homes that have to be built every year to meet the need. 
Great. We build a thousand a year. Wow. So you're never going to meet, meet the meat unless you do something great. So what I really look for is you try to address the problems by glutting the market with a lot of homes. For developers like ours, glutting that may, may not be the best thing because then we can't hold to our prices. But glutting the market means that there's more homes that are competing for dollars, and therefore the prices will go down. Wow. The speculations will go down. And you build more rental housing so you can help those people. Then you need to look at some form of institutionalized housing where it would be maybe single room occupancy, provide them a room where they can, anybody can rent there, and then you provide health services and psychological services and social services right, right there within the premises. Nobody wants it in their community. So it's one that it requires a lot of political will, and I hope that our elected officials will take to heart for the next task at hand. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. I mean, you have yeah. so much experience and so many ideas. I hope they're all like, asking you exactly like <laughs> what you think and what they should be doing to really allow these things to happen at a quicker rate. Now, you've been the chair of the Honolulu Police Commission. You've yes. been the chair of the Honolulu Chamber of Commerce. You were the president of the Hawaii Developers Council. What boards are you currently serving on right now? Um, I am on the um a federal home loan bank wow. that represents um, 13 states. Great. Um, I, I'm also on the board of Central Pacific Bank. Great. And uh, YMCA. Awesome. Advisory board of the Catholic Charities, the Kahala Nui. Yeah. <laughs> you can see that I'm involved in a lot of different places because I have a hard time saying no when it comes to helping out. Well, you have so much, so much talent and experience. <laughs> <laughs> when they ask for help, I say, how can I help? And, and it's been my model in a way. I don't have to be on the board. In fact, I usually tell people, you know, I don't need to be on this board. What I'd like to be is to be able to have meaningful contribution towards helping. Yeah. And so that's where, that's where I'm focused most. I, my time is very limited, so I can't sit at board meetings. Yeah. But I can certainly help in their issues. And so I'm involved with maybe a dozen. Um, Blue Planet Foundation Blue as Planet well? Blue Planet Foundation Whoa. is, um, I'm the vice chair Great. this year of that board. And, you know, that uh, people say that you're a developer, so you're, why would you be involved in the Blue Planet? Um, and the way I look at it is we all live in the same planet, yeah, and we have true. kids, and, you know, this is our community. Yeah. We have to protect our future. Yeah, you're right. Now, how do you keep outdoing what you've done? You've accomplished so many things, and you're hugely successful. How do you keep outdoing what you've done? That's not my focus. <laughs> the focus is doing the right thing for the right reason. Yeah. So no, it could have. be doing nothing. Okay. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's not about outdoing. I think it's really about trying to fit a need. Um, and so oftentimes I look at what we do and I think, is it mission based? Do we achieve something that I believe in? Can I wake up in the morning and feel that I've done something better? left this place better than the next, right? And you definitely have. And so every project I've done, I feel that way. Great. And when that happens, I don't need to outdo myself. <laughs> no. I like it. It's a constant striving for excellence is what you have. Yeah. Well, Christine, it was a pleasure having you on the show today. You achieve so many things and you, you are, you're inspiring not just women, but a lot of men out there <laughs> to really want to be better and to you know, have a vision, but actually go out there and do it and make the world a better place and help people. So really want to thank you for taking time to be on the show today. Oh, I had fun. Thank you very much, Rusty. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Rusty Komori encouraging you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha.